came about. Uh, well, thank you all for being here. Um, the, the reason that we're showing the, the film again there is that me and the editor have spent so long on this film. <laughs> we thought we made you watch it twice. <laughs> So you can get a sense of what it was like for us. Anyway, sorry. But going back to what that was at the end, uh, right at the beginning, it started with uh, the writer, as it always does, Alex Garland, who had this, uh, yeah, he's a wonderful writer and director now. And um, he had this kind of like 100 page treatment of a, a story about these. Uh, much as, uh, funnily enough, as Killian described it at the beginning about this group of incredibly able people, but lonely people shot out into space. And that's really where it, it, where, where it, where it all started, really. And so, Brian, at what stage did you get involved? Um, I, I was sent a script, and actually, um, I was doing my PhD at the time, and my supervisor ended up with the script. I don't know if you know this, but, and he thought for a few days that he'd been asked to work on this film. And then, and then, uh, and then he got a message, from, I think it was from Andrew Randall, saying, yeah, we would uh, well, it might be from you saying, well, we've seen you on a horizon on the BBC and you're this kind of young physicist and this young physicist in the film and we thought you kind of were a bit like him. And my supervisor, who's kind of 60 years old, went, oh, shit. <laughs> 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 Damn music. And you knocked on my door. So that's, that's how I got involved. <laughs> <laughs> it's great having a scientific advisory role because you can take all the blame for all the science <laughs> <It's him. laughs> there he is. And, and you think that is a challenge with scientific films or, or science fiction? Um, because you want the wonder, but and you want to sort of play with ideas, but at the same time you want to keep it scientifically true. So why was that a challenge for you to sort of keep on the straight and narrow? And without sort of get bringing off into, into the unknown? Well, I, I learned a lot because at the time I think I'd, I'd only made one documentary, I think, The Horizon. And uh, I remember you, Danny, saying to me that it's uh, it, it's not a documentary, it's a film. But So we, it, the world needs to be believable. And also, as Killian said in the introduction, actually, I spent a lot of time with the actors, which were just magnificent. So Danny had arranged for me to give lectures to the cast, and actually um, Killian came to CERN with me for about for a few days, and sat there and, and observed the way that scientists interact. And so it became more for me I remember having conversations, I think you said that you tried um, having the, the spaceship with no sound, and it just it didn't look right. <laughs> so, so I learned a lot actually about that, that, that balance between keeping the, the, the cinematic nature and the tension, and, uh, but also scientific ideas and accuracy where you can, particularly with the, the performance, I think, of the cast more than the, uh, the, the other thing he says as well was gravity. And, of course, in 2001, Kubrick could have bought that set, but everybody else just has a bit of the spaceship rotating. <laughs> that's it, isn't it? That's gravitation. Yeah. You, you, you follow in a very narrow corridor of uh, your, the predecessors who've been into space before, because we've not spent very much, very much time in space, really. So the stories aren't that extensive unless you go into fantasy, of course. And um, so you're, you're constantly, films like 2001, set certain parameters that we know as an audience, all of us as, as, as fellow watchers of films, we believe is space, which is slow motion, which is nonsense, of course. But that's Kubrick and the pen in, you know, and the slow motion pen, it's, it's not true. It's things move at the same speed, if, if anything, perhaps even slightly quicker, because there's less resistance. But you have to do this in a film, and it causes you enormous problems, and how to get gravity-bound actors to appear to be floating for those kind of sequences. Yes, and so you feel it's yes, limited by what's gone on before. I've heard of standing on the shoulders of giants, but it doesn't help as if it's been that fun to stand on these shoulders. No, it's amazing, but I mean, it's incredibly intimidating. <laughs> Because they are some of our, well, like, I'm sure for you guys to be here on a Saturday night, you're sci-fi fans, and I'm a sci-fi fan, and those are some of the mass, absolute masterpieces, you know, what you're talking about. 2001, Solaris, in an intellectual sense, and, and the aliens, and, you know, they get, and it goes on and on, the camera films, and what have you, yeah. So, um, Danny, was there a piece, or something you wanted to include the film, but Brian said, sorry, scientifically, you just can't do that. Was there anything you really wanted to, to keep on doing? Uh, I, I wouldn't have got very far. The biggest thing was is 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 the is the, the shield, which would be gold foil, of course. Is, and in fact, there, are, there is some footage of a satellite 
a NASA satellite that's extraordinary as it unfurls in space. And it's a sail, and it's as thin as anything. But of course, we have the problem with it, which is actors have to stand on it, have to be on it, and they are um, going to rip it because they're, they're human beings. We grow up, oh, it's just so endless. So we actually end up with a solid shield. So we, we, we stepped away from the reality in a number of ways, didn't we? Yeah, and wasn't there a beautiful thing, I think it was in the script initially, that, that everyone on Earth had donated their wedding rings or their gold jewellery to build that shield, yeah, which I thought was really... The, that's one of the things I remember, actually, this tremendous backstory that, that Alex had written and backstories for all the characters. This, this real richness to the film, which comes through, I suppose, in performance. Yes. You know, but you don't, it's, it's not all in, in the film. Yes, so when we see a snapshot, you... You can feel that the characters are developed, they feel rounded, they feel real, because they have that backstory, they have faces, and then again, what, what's happening on Earth? Yeah, Killian, actually, you saw it very, really briefly, he's bunk when he's there with, uh, with, uh, with Cassie, and there's a, the paper, the scientific paper's on the wall, and that was one of my papers, actually. <laughs> <laughs> scattering in the absence of the Higgs boson, the LHC. So I've written this paper before the LHC turned on. It's my most successful paper, but it's completely wrong. <laughs> it's on the wall. But that's the scientific process. It's something that's actually going on. And so the whole idea of the sort of sun, sort of losing power, and having to be, having to be reunited, not to freak people out, but is there any chance? Yeah, there's some good. <laughs> <laughs> and if so, what would we do about it? Well, eventually. Yeah, five million years. Yeah. And no, I remember actually when I got the script, and I was so excited, a huge science fiction fan, and a huge Danny fan, of course, uh, and I just thought, oh, this is incredible. And I, and, I, and I read the script, and it said, our son is dying, and we're going to fix it. And I was like, oh, shit. <laughs> I've got a problem with that. Page <laughs> one. I mean, you can fit a million Earths inside it. But, having said that, um, when we were at CERN, actually, um, we went and visited lots of theorists where Gillian was with, with me. And we said, is there any way that you could, you know, something could happen? And we came up with this kind of backstory, which I think is in the DVD extras, about these, these strange particles called cube balls, which were a kind of wild, but semi-plausible scientific idea that could eat the, perhaps eat or, or suffocate the core of a star. So, so there was some kind of idea afterwards of some really, you know, very speculative science. But I don't think so. But, uh, but that's, I mean, maybe what the comic, because that, that's, for me, that wasn't the point of the film. For me, it's this, this, this story of the, these fragile little things trying to come to terms with the power of nature. And, and so that, that, that initial setup is beautiful because you, you get to see the power of this star. And, and I should say, I spoke to Killian a lot about that scene. He was fascinated by that scene at the end where he, where he puts his hand up and goes face to face with the sun. And, and, and he said to me, and quite a few other physicists he met actually, what would, if, you, if you studied something for your whole life and you know, with subatomic particles or stars, I mean, you, you yourself, you study these things, these powerful things in space. What would you think if you could touch it for the, just for a moment? What, what, what would be, and he, was, he became really fascinated with that single moment. And, and it was, you know, he wanted to act it, but he became philosophically interested in what it would be like to end your life in that way. But anybody seems to be attracted to the sun, the brightness of the sun. You know? So, you know, uh, darken up the filter a bit more, give me a bit more. Is that, uh, it's, uh, sort of, you know, the, uh, 99.9% of our, of our solar system sits in the sun. The sun. And, uh, yeah, but you really, especially on this screen, you really feel that power. And that's really came across in the film. Yeah, that, that, I mean, that's obviously one of the wonders of um, being able to do something like this, to try and attempt to portray it because it's invisible to us. Well, it, we can't look at it, we can't see it with a huge amount of filters. Our perception of it is entirely false because it's all uh, um, through huge filtering powers that are put on all the telescopes. So, so to poeticise it by being able to contact it in some way and to reach for it is a kind of our vanity and, and our ambition and you know, there's everything about us really to be able to reach for that. And that actually, that signal is that the figures that they, the right of the, um, that are drawn on the, 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 is it the Voyager that's gone into completely into outer space? Yes, and the picture, on, on the picture of it, it, is the humans are holding their hand up like that, yeah. aren't they, in that gesture, I think. 
Yeah, so please welcome. welcome. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Yeah